But thank you very much for inviting me to speak uh, this morning on the um, role of experts in guideline development. Um, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I have the following disclosures. So I'd like to start this talk by acknowledging what all of you actually already know, which is that it's um, very difficult to define who is an expert when you're developing guidelines. And even if you could, it's harder still to define um, what an expert's role should be in guideline development. And what we do know is that as long as there have been guidelines, there have been experts who have challenged the results of those guidelines. And I suspect that all of you as guideline developers have experienced that. Um, we have certainly experienced that in guideline development in the United States. Here's just one example uh, of cholesterol guidelines under attack, and they were attacked for being both too conservative and too, um, and too radical, so they kind of got attacked from all sides. NICE guidelines have not been uh, protected from these kinds of attacks by experts, and I, I'm sure if I looked hard enough, uh, I could find examples from each of your countries um, from different guidelines, and, and if your countries have escaped that um, attack by experts, then for sure next year you guys should be giving this talk because maybe you figured it out. In the U.S., actually, experts have taken to the mainstream media to start talking about um, their disagreement with certain guidelines. Um, this, this, these um, three experts, two radiologists, one surgeon, breast surgeon, um, took to the mainstream media to discuss their disagreement with um, new uh, breast cancer screening um, guidelines that actually increased the um, will uh, in increase the age of starting um, screening and um, also the decrease, uh, increase the interval of screening in older patients. Um, and I can't read it on there, so I'm going to have to turn around here. They said, um, we profoundly disagree with these changes. We think it's no noteworthy that while there were medical specialists involved in an advisory group, the panel actually charged with the developing the new guidelines did not include a single surgeon, radiologist, or medical oncologist who specializes in the care and treatment of breast cancer, not one. And we understand that the rationale for this may have been to prevent bias in interpreting the data. At the same time, we observed that in a panel that included an economist and public health experts, there was potential for bias the other way in favor of cutting costs um, over saving lives. So in other words, they called into question three fundamental issues. First of all, who is an expert? Second of all, who should be on a guideline development panel? Which experts should be on the panel? And third, what constitutes conflict of interest or could lead to bias um, among experts? And so today, I'd like to review with you, actually, the um, definitions of conflict of interest as it relates to experts. I'd like to examine the influential role of uh, experts in guideline development. Uh, I'd like to discuss the diabetes guideline controversy specifically as an example, and we'll get to that, and perhaps propose a path forward. So this influential um, document from the National Academy of Medicine published in 2011 uh, needs no introduction to all of you, but I would like to just call out the place where they started to define experts and the role of experts. And they said that most knowledgeable individuals regarding the subject matter addressed by guideline are frequently conflicted. These experts often possess unique insight into guideline-relevant content domains through their research or clinical involvement, and those who have such insight may simply be without substitute. Optimally, guideline development groups are made up of members without conflicts of interest, but experts who have unique knowledge about the topic under consideration but who have conflicts of interest can share their expertise with the guideline development group as consultants and as reviewers, but generally they should not um, serve as members um, of the group. They, they go on to say that you know, some experts with conflict of interest can, can serve as members, but perhaps they should 
be in the minority of the group. And this is, in this document, um, at least my read of it, the closest we actually get to the definition, strict definition of an expert. So uh, the Gen principles actually took these recommendations um, one step further and started to uh, codify and define conflict of interest as it relates to experts. And in here, I think it's really the indirect conflicts of interest that are most relevant. Uh, financial and direct conflict of interest, I think we understand pretty well. But the indirect conflicts of interest, you know, which focus on having published, uh, on being an acknowledged clinical expert, uh, on being part of a group or membership of a group, um, those are things that um, are sometimes a little bit more intangible as a conflict of interest, but relate directly to um, whether, you're, um, whether you're considered an expert. And I do want to point out that at least in this document, and I know different groups have used these um, guidelines in different ways, these principles, um, that all these indirect conflicts of interest are kind of, as examples, are parallel. So there isn't necessarily a gradation that you should treat one differently from the other if you have a relevant indirect conflict of interest. And in fact, Jin goes on to say that guideline developers should make all possible efforts to not include members with direct financial or relevant indirect conflicts of interest, and that experts with relevant conflict of interest and specific knowledge of expertise should participate in the discussion, uh, but there should be appropriate balance of opinion among those sought to provide input. So why are we so worried about the influential role of experts in guideline development and, and um, these issues. And for this, I actually want to go back um, to the literature, some of the literature uh, from Dr. Hutchings and, and others. And the first one I want to go back to is a RAND study that was done about 20 years ago. And this used the uh, modified RAND UCLA um, Delphi approach that um, Andrew already described, so I don't have to, which is wonderful. Um, but the authors compared the appropriateness ratings of panelists from different specialties uh, for six surgical pr procedures. So they had multiple panels for these six pr sur surgical procedures. And what they found was that between 10 to 42% of indications were found to be appropriate by performing practitioners, so the people who actually did the procedures, um, but less than appropriate by primary care physicians. And that physicians who performed the procedure of interest rated more indications as appropriate and necessary than either primary care physicians or physicians in a different um, specialty. So, um, you know, in other words, if you do the procedure, you're going to rate things more as more appropriate and, um, and for more people. And these findings were echoed in, in research that, um, that Andrew also talked about. Um, where they did a systematic review of included that study and other studies. And the bottom line, again, is that practitioners who performed a procedure tended to emphasize the appropriateness of those procedures. But the good news was that participating in multidisciplinary efforts uh, moderated this influence. So it, it moderated the influence of experts if you were in a group that had experts and others, methodologists, non-proceduralists. Um, non the WHO had a similar review, comprehensive review of this topic, and they also very similarly um, concluded that groups should be composed or include or have access to experts um, with necessary technical skills, uh, but that there should be um, um, you know, broad representation. And also um, pointed out that there is really little evidence right now, little research to guide the exact composition of a panel. And finally, back to the uh, National Academy of Medicine. Uh, which also called out the, um, the role for multidisciplinary participation. And they really felt that that would increase the representation of the evidence, but it would also um, give a sense of ownership to the members of the development group. So if you had a multi multidisciplinary involvement, um, hopefully um, those 
experts participating would feel that they own the guideline more and that would uh, get it accepted more readily. And finally, Jen said the guideline development panel should include diverse and relevant stakeholders such as health professionals, methodologists, experts on a topic, and patients or other healthcare consumers. So, in summary, what we know is that diversity is good, that multidisciplinary approaches are good, but we're still missing important aspects of our guidance because what we have really very little guidance on at this point is how to decide which stakeholders actually should be part of a panel. How many of each type? What, how should the um, guideline topic actually influence who we invite to the panel? You know, maybe it's different for different topics depending on what we're reviewing. What kinds of experts should be included as actually members of a panel, as reviewers, as consultants? We don't have guidance on that. And you know, the answers to these questions are important not just for guideline development and not just um, for patients, because of course it's important for that, but everybody who uses the guidelines in the future for other purposes um, should care about the answers to these questions. Okay. So, um, I just want to give you a couple of examples from our own work where we try to um, look at the um, influence of uh, guideline development. And in particular, we looked at the proportion of intensification recommendations and de-intensification recommendations, so recommendations to stop or scale back treatment or tests. Uh, for diabetes and cardiovascular guidelines in the U.S. And we looked across seven uh, developers of those guidelines. And mainly we wanted to understand if there's variation in the uh, proportion of intensification and de-intensification recommendations by each group. And the answer, as you can see in this graph, is yes. There's wide variation from no de-intensification recommendations to actually de-intensification uh, recommendations being um, more used more often than de-intensification recommendations. Um, and we don't really know the role that experts played in this, but, but what we do know from the evidence that, that I just showed you, which is that if you have specialists in the room, you're more likely to wind up with intensification uh, than de-intensification recommendations, and, and we suspect at least some of that happened here. Um, this is also important for choosing wisely recommendations, choosing wisely the movement in, in many countries now to uh, focus on uh, having patients and, and physicians discuss when to stop doing services. And um, here in this pace, paper, uh, Nancy Morden and colleagues uh, pointed out that, as, especially early on in the choosing wisely recommendations in the US, uh, most proceduralists included few of their own services, their own operative services as choosing wisely recommendations, and, and they, they, were, they developed them, the specialty societies developed them. And similarly, cognitive specialists uh, included few of their own rev revenue generating services. So neurologists, for example, didn't include EMGs um, as a choosing wisely recommendation, even though uh, it's one of their biggest revenue generating um, areas. And guidelines are also, as you know, often used for performance measures. And so um, having valid guidelines and, and experts' uh, opinion used appropriately within guidelines is going to translate to performance measures. So this is a study we did with the American College of Physicians uh, where we actually looked at 86 um, uh, 86 performance measures recommended in the Medicare program, and we found that of those 86, only 32 uh, were found to be valid, or 37%. Um, and we also found that measures that had undergone review or development by a multidisciplinary group were more likely to be found valid by our review process. We actually used a modified Delphi uh, process to rate these. So maybe you're feeling like Lucy, having a disquieting epiphany. 
Um, I certainly was when I started to review this literature. But I want to delve a little bit further, uh, even, and that is to talk to you a little bit about uh, diabetes guidelines that were released recently by the American College of Physicians, of which I'm a member, uh, but I did not participate in this guideline panel. And um, as you can see, major medical associations feud over diabetes guidelines. So um, this happens a lot in the US. What was all this about? Well, it was about guidelines um, that looked at appropriate targets for patients with diabetes, glycemic control targets, also called hemoglobin A1C targets. And as you can see from this graph, the American College of Physicians called uh, for targets that were um, a little less stringent, 7 to 8 percent, uh, than two major uh, endocrine uh, societies, uh, which called for much more stringent um, targets. And the American College of Physicians actually did a uh, formal review of all the guidelines that were out there at the time, listed by, uh, listed here. They used agree to criteria to rate them. And um, I just want to show you some of those results. Um, basically, I'm focused really on stakeholder involvement and uh, editorial independence for the purposes of this talk. And just to point out here that the um, kind of top two bars in each of these graphs uh, are from the two diabetes specialty societies that I, that I uh, and endocrine specialty societies that I mentioned, and they always get the lowest ratings in terms of um, these two, um, these two agree to areas, and also overall. So if you, if you see the overall ratings done by, uh, again, by the American College of Physicians on a one to seven scale, the, um, the American Association of Endocrinology as well as the ADA had the lowest overall assessment ratings and also the most stringent um, recommendations. Um, those two specialty societies made up almost entirely of specialists in their guideline development group. So um, Medscape actually had a conversation, if you will, uh, with both the American College of Physicians and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology. And I just want to kind of summarize that conversation. Um, so here a representative of the ACP uh, said, I'll turn this way for a moment, uh, there is no high quality evidence that achieving an A1C of less than 7% improves clinical outcomes and it leads to harms, medication burdens, and costs. <clears throat> Excuse me. ACP's analysis of the evidence behind existing guidelines found that treatment with drugs to target 7% or less, compared with targets of about 8%, did not reduce deaths or macrovascular complications such as heart attack or stroke, but did result in substantial harms. To that, the uh, uh, representative from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology said, this is absolutely wrong and regressive. There is no evidence to support higher goals in the management of the majority of patients with diabetes, while there is an overabundance of evidence to show that lower A1C is better. Hopefully, most primary care clinicians will continue to follow the current leading guidelines, after which were listed this expert's conflicts of interest. So, um, in its wisdom, the Annals of Internal Medicine realized that there was uh, some debate on this guideline and actually elicited uh, what they call brief commentaries. There were uh, several of these brief commentaries t published on uh, different topics, and I'm just calling out one of them. Uh, here from two endocrinologists who wrote, uh, no clinical endocrinologists were on the writing committee. When committees exclude experts because of conflicts, those left without any conflicts may have less expertise. And declaring ACP members who are an expert in a disease state ineligible to participate can result in confusion after publication. So in essence, what we're seeing is the same argument here as we saw in the very beginning of my talk from the breast surgeons and uh, radiologists, right? Um, we need to include, according to the experts, the experts in the guideline panel, because if not, we're going to get confusion at the end, and we're certainly going to get pushback. 
So, in the end, I'm certainly not an expert, but I think the um, discussion comes down to this. If, if I were an expert, what makes me an expert? And as an expert, what is my unique role in, gui in the guideline development process? In other words, what constitutes individual clinical expertise or the proficiency of experts whose opinion we seek in guideline development? What types of experts should be included as members or consultants, even if they have indirect conflicts, and when? And as experts who are conflicted because, experts who are conflicted because they published an evidence review on the guidelines, uh, topic different from those who have an industry grant, for example, or from those who gain clinical income from the intervention, or from those who have direct conflict of interest. And, and I'm particularly interested here in the indirect conflicts of interest. Is there some gradation? And what we know about the use of experts right now is, is that it's kind of all over the place. Um, there's some guidelines that actually include a majority of topic experts. You know, some of those diabetes guidelines I mentioned, I looked at their list, and there was, you know, maybe one or two who weren't even financially conflicted, and they were all endocrinologists or, or topic experts. Um, some didn't include any, and they prevent experts from voting. Um, and some have this kind of in-between, maybe less than 50 percent. Um, I would also say that, from my read, no uh, guideline development group currently that I saw uh, reviewing these diabetes guidelines and others appear to have the full range of diversity that's called for by the GIN standards, and that um, guidelines rarely clearly stated the role of each member and the expertise of each member. Now, that, those, that's an agreed-to criteria, right, to do that, but we don't necessarily include that on our websites or in our literature. What is that exact role? So, what can we do for the future? And by we, I really mean Jen, I really mean all of you. Well, we can clearly define what constitutes being an expert. We can distinguish desirable and undesirable qualities of experts and distinguish among indirect conflicts of interest. I think we should propose clear guidance about what types of expertise are necessary for robust guideline development and how it might vary by topic. We should... Um, solicit members for their expertise rather than their membership in a society. And even if we have um, a guideline development group that's all members of a society, we should maybe bring others in um, to that group. I know many of you already do that. Um, and finally, we should clearly identify the role and expertise of each member in our publications, on our websites, very specifically, why is this person on the guideline development group, not just because they're a professor or they are a, a specialist in the field. And while I didn't talk about it, I know it's being talked a lot about in this conference, uh, I try to always remember in my work who the real expert in the room is. So, um, Einstein, I'm sure, was thinking about guideline development when he said everything should be made as simple as possible but not one bit simpler. And we all know that guideline development is not simple. We know that incorporating experts is not simple. Uh, but I'm confident that the members of GIN are the right experts for the job to figure this out. Thank you. <laughs>